Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm Jen. And I'm Sarah. And we are Unabridged, the podcast where teachers take on books. Join us each week for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content every week. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 222. We are going to be discussing true crime books today. And as a full disclosure, some of us like these better than others on our on our team. So you'll get to find that out soon. Uh, Before we get started, I wanted to remind you that we have links in our show notes, our bookish faves, book reviews for bookshop.org. When you use those links, you are able to support a local bookstore and also support Unabridged too, which is really nice. And bookshop.org is a great organization who supports independent bookstores, and we really believe in what they're doing. So we would love for you to use our links and shop at bookshop.org because they're awesome. So let's get started with our bookish check-in. Ashley, what are you reading? So one of the ones I'm reading is thanks to Sarah's recommendation not long ago on our Cozy Mysteries episode. This is Mia P. Manansala's Arsenic and Adobo. And Sarah talked about this one on the Cozy Mysteries episode and said it's all about food and also about a sleuthing into what's going on with this murder that happens early on in the book. I read one of Abby Collette's books for The Cozy Mystery and I absolutely loved it. And so I was looking for something else that was like that. And also the next one in this series, I can't remember the exact date. I think it has already come out, but it it just now, the second is coming out in this series. So that was another reason. Um, Homicide and Hollow Hollow is what the second one is called. And so I wanted to read it for that reason too, because I'm excited to read the new one. And this has been really great so far. So Leela is the main character and she is coming home to her family and, and supporting her Tita Rosie, who has a restaurant and she's had some issues, like she had a breakup. And so she's trying to get over that. And so she's coming back home, but she has all these aunties who are really involved in her life and they are very interested in matchmaking and wanting to kind of get things going for her. And early on, there is an incident at the restaurant and the the person who is a food critic in town that everyone very much dislikes suddenly has an episode and then he dies. And so chaos ensues and, <laughs> and we, we find out that Leela, he was her ex boyfriend. She has all this baggage related to him And then pretty quickly, you can tell that there has been like people have tried to sabotage her and her family to blame them for this death. And so the restaurant is closed because they need to get cleared by the health inspector and they already were kind of on the rocks. And so that's really stressful. And then also Leela is is being blamed for this murder. And so she is trying to find her way forward. But I think what I love is that even though there are some very serious things happening in the book, it's also... I love seeing her connections to her family. There's a lot of really beautiful descriptions of food and just, you know, the love for food and how that can bring community. And we see that not just with her and her own family and their Filipino restaurant, but also with the the other restaurants in the community. And so I love all of that. And she also has a really great best friend and they have a really sweet relationship. And so I really love seeing that and seeing the way that she's supported through friendship and through her family. And so, so far it is just really great. I'm glad that I picked it up and I think I could do some more cozy mysteries in 2022. (laughs) So again, that is Mia P. Manasala's Arsenic and Adobo and is the first in that series. I love that one. That was great. I want to dive into that soon. I've been seeing everyone reviewing the second one on Bookstagram and I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel behind, but (laughs) I need to do the second one. I'm very interested. Jen, what are you reading? 
So I actually just finished this one, but I cannot bear not to share it. This is 3D Umragar's Honor, and I read this with Read with Tony, and I listened to the audio, which was phenomenal. I would highly recommend it, but uh, this story just totally captivated me. I did not, we, we always do a stopping point midway, and I did not want to stop halfway through because it is so good. So I would say we begin with protagonist Smita, who is an Indian American journalist, And she gets a call one day from one of her colleagues named Shannon that she is in India and has been injured very badly in an accident. And she asks Smita to come and help her. When Smita gets there, she realizes that Shannon does not want help with her surgery and recovery and navigating all of that, that she wants Smita to take over on the story that she has been reporting. So Smita grew up in India And then when she was in her early teens, her family moved to the United States. And this is sort of a mystery that through much of the book, we don't know what happened, but it is clear that something really bad happened to make her family move from their home in India to the United States. But that is kind of in the background. No one in her family has been back since that happened. So at first she is very resentful that Shannon has, she feels sort of brought her here under false pretenses, but eventually her compassion wins out and she agrees to report on this story. The story itself is the parallel story to Smita's story. So it is about a woman named Mina, who is Hindu, and she married a Muslim man against her brother's wishes. So she lived with her two brothers and her sister. And After they were married, you don't get the whole story, but you know from the beginning that her brothers set her husband on fire and killed him. And Mina herself was badly burned and is now disabled. Mm. And Mina lives in a very small village that is basically ruled by this man who has a lot of power and does not think women should work and thinks that the brother should have complete control. And and she has never really advocated for herself, but she got involved with an attorney and is actually suing her brothers. It's like a wrongful death suit, which is just unheard of and has set her community on its, on its head. So that is the story that Smita has been called in to report on. And it brings up all of these feelings about India and the reasons that her family left, it, it is really complex because you also see her beginning to realize the things that she loved about her country. So her thoughts have been largely negative. And, and certainly the story is just reinforcing that. But then as she travels to this small village, her friend Shannon sends her with this man named Mohan, who is her friend, to be her translator. Smita speaks some of the language, but not enough to be fluent. And so they feel like she needs a translator and also just that she needs to travel with someone to be safe. And Mohan is wonderful and generous and really open-minded and is distraught that Smita feels so badly about India. So he's sort of trying to convince her that India is not just its negative qualities, that it also has positive qualities. And basically the narrative just goes back and forth between Smita's reporting her travels through India, her getting to know Mohan, and then Mina telling her story. And you see the relationship with the man who ultimately becomes her husband, how it begins, and the way she really takes a risk for love. I mean, I don't know if you all can tell, but I loved this book so much. It it made me cry, but it also has these beautiful, heartwarming moments. I, I just... Absolutely loved it. So that is 3D Umragar's honor. Mm, that sounds phenomenal, Jen. Uh, yeah. Gosh. I think you both would absolutely love it. And again, so it has a single narrator. The audiobook narrator is Sneha Mathan, and she does separate voices for Smita and Mina that are just, she, she is a phenomenal narrator. And so I would recommend the audio though, the people in the buddy read who are doing the print enjoy that as well. 
That sounds amazing. Yeah. And also really gut wrenching. Yeah. 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 It's definitely a journey through the book. So Sarah, how about you? What are you reading? Well, like Ashley, when we did the Cozy Mystery episode, I was very excited to read both of the ones that Jen and Ashley mentioned. So I'm almost finished with Jesse Q. Sutanto's Dial A for Aunties. (laughs) And I have to say, (laughs) I'm listening listening to this on audio and it is... First of all, it's hysterical. Uh It is just like Jen said, it is super over the top. So there is definitely, definitely a, you have to just kind of suspend disbelief and just go with it. But if you do, it's a, it's a fun ride. So this book centers around Medi. She is from a Chinese Indonesian family and so the, none of the, her, her mom And her are close. And then her mom has three sisters who are her aunties. And all of them have had relationships before, but none of them are in current relationships. So they're kind of like, they all live on the same street. They all work in the same business. They all have, they have this wedding company and they all think Medi needs to be in a relationship and start and get married and have some children. And so they're always meddling in Medi's life and she puts up with it, but she gets very frustrated by it. So her mom signs her up for <laughs> like a Tinder type <laughs> dating app <laughs> and impersonates her. And there, there is a language. What could go wrong? <laughs> right, right. And there is a language barrier. So, there are some references to eggplant and her mom thinks that, <laughs> that the, the gentleman is offering to make Medi's favorite food, eggplant parmigiana. That is not the case. But Med- so all of this is unbeknownst to Medi. And so her mom sets up a date and then she finally tells Medi that she has been doing this for weeks, like impersonating her on this dating app. And she set up this date and Medi goes to the date and the... <laughs> She goes to the date and the, the she has dinner with the guy and she drinks a little bit too much and she's going to get an Uber and he offers to take her home and then he basically traps her in a car the car and it is apparent that he is going to sexually assault her and he's driving in these back alleys. Well, Medi tases him. <laughs> they get in a car accident and he dies allegedly. So that is where the story begins. And it is a quite a ride. It's just a lot. There are definitely, I remember Jen saying there are weekend at Bernie vibes and there are. So it is, it's just really funny and humorous. The aunties are hysterical and I just really enjoyed my time with these women. And again, it is, I have to say, if you need your mysteries to feel like they're based in reality and that's something that could happen. This is not the book for you. Nope. But if you can just be like, I'm here for a good time, then it's great. It's funny. It's weird that there is murder and all this, but there's just all these hijinks that are hilarious and it's just fun. It's just a fun book and it made me laugh and I really, I'm really enjoying it and it's almost done and I'm going to be sad when it's done. So <laughs> that is Jesse Q. Sutanto's Dial A for Aunties. And I re- highly recommend it on audio. I'm so glad you listened because I thought <laughs> that narrator was so good at just, yeah, every <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> moment of it. It's just perfection. It was so good. I loved it. All right. So now we are at the point that we're going to do our main discussion and our main discussion today is on true crime books. This is a genre that I adore. I love reading true crime books. I like listening to, to, to true crime podcasts. So I'm very excited for our discussion today. And I'm sure Jen maybe put this quote in our planning document. So I'm going to share it because I think it's perfect for to begin the discussion. And the quote is from Only Murders in the Building, the Hulu show starring, mm-hmm. <laughs> starring Selena Gomez. Martin Short and Steve Martin. And I've watched an episode and I really enjoyed it. And I know Jen and Ashley have watched more and they both enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Too. So if you like true crime and true crime pro- podcasts, that might be something you want to look into. But the quote is every true crime story is actually true for someone. And so that being said, we're going to get started with our recommendations. Ashley, what is your recommendation? 
<laughs> so first, I should say that this is probably <laughs> my least favorite genre of all the genres I can think of in the world. <laughs> so, so I'm just going to start with that. And, and I want to say also that I absolutely adored Only Murders in the Building. I mean, I loved it. So even if you don't love true crime, you actually may find that you love it. I mean, I'm in the podcasting world, so I do have that going for me because there is a pod, they, they are doing a podcast that's the premise of the episodes. And so that might be why I liked it so much. But I mean, also they are just brilliant and yes. brilliant together. And I think it's very unusual to see women and men of different age ranges who are friends. And I just loved all of that also. Like this really unlikely friendship comes up and I thought all of that was so beautiful. And yeah, so I I absolutely loved that series. I mean, I feel like I, of all the things I've watched in the last couple of years, I probably enjoyed that the most. So mm-hmm. I did love it. But yes, as far as the genre, I did try to read a couple. I went through a couple before <laughs> and <laughs> finally said, I'm going to stop torturing myself. So the one that I'm recommending is neither of the uh, true crime ones I read, but instead this one is more true crime adjacent. And it is one I would highly recommend. And this is Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered. <laughs> <laughs> and this is written by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff. And so Georgia and Karen are the hosts of My Favorite Murder, which is a wildly, wildly successful podcast. And I have to say that I loved this book so much that I have thought about listening to that. There are a couple, Sarah has shared a couple of podcast series that she really loved in the true crime genre that I have thoroughly enjoyed. So even though I don't love reading the books particularly, I have found that some of the podcasts I really like. And so, you know, I feel like they're they're kind of like cozy mysteries. It's funny that we both Mm -hmm. picked that today, Sarah, for our (laughs) quickest check-in, but it just shows that, you know, that was another one that that's just a genre I haven't read much of. And so I do think that there are books out there that I probably would really like. And I think that's true of true crime, that there's probably some out there I would like, and it's just an untapped genre for me and one that I have a negative attitude toward, but maybe that's, you know, not an entirely fair attitude. So about my book, Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered. This is a memoir for each of them. I mean, they each have chapters. They each share about their own lives, but it does also touch on true crime. There are some things, both experiences they've had in their own life that are assault related or crime related and also experiences they've had researching the podcast where they talk about some of the backstory. And so they do touch on like what it looks like that sometimes when we're talking about true crime and we get into these cases, it can be kind of voyeuristic. And so they really talk about like, what does that mean? And how do we respect the people who are involved and the people who are who have survived the situation, but are still deeply impacted by it and like what that looks like. So, I mean, I think that quote, you know, every true crime story is actually true for someone. It's something we all have to work through when we talk about the genre. And I think sometimes I get hung up on that, that like, it's hard for me to feel like it's not being sensationalized. And then I find that really off-putting if I feel like that's the case. I think that's part of why the podcast or the Hulu series worked for me is because it's all fiction anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that's like easier for me. I'm not having to work through this thing that happened in real life. But anyway, this one, the thing that really struck me about it, it is hilarious, but also really powerful in the sense that I felt like Hardstark and Kilgariff have really had to reckon with this topic a lot. And because of that, they have had these revelations, each of them, about their own life, about the way that they see things in society, about the way we handle true crime, the way we talk about assault, that I found really impactful. And there were things that they said that I had never considered before. I mean, one of the things that I remember really struck me was they were talking about domestic abuse and sexual assault, and how we count the number of women raped instead of the number of men who committed acts of rape. And how when we talk about abused women, we're always talking about abused women as if it is a passive act, and there is no actor. And I just thought how powerful language is and how the way that when we make something passive, we take away blame because we're taking away the, the in this case, the assaulter, and we're instead referring to the assaulted as if to suggest that the person who was assaulted didn't have someone who did the thing to them. And I thought that was really powerful and also surprising that I hadn't thought through all that before. But I just think when they started talking about those statistics and the way that they are counted 
and handled by the news that it does absolve people of blame. It's not pointing to the people who committed the crimes, but instead to the to the victims. And so that's just one small example, but I felt like throughout the book, there were a lot of moments that were just kind of aha moments for me that were making me think about things in a way I hadn't fully considered. And another early on chapter in it that I found really impactful was called F Politeness. I I will say that both of them are very frank and they have um, lots of colorful language, which I'm 100% here for. (laughs) If you're not, then, you know, that is something to consider. But anyway, that entire focus of that section of the book is about how, although it is never a victim's fault, we do these things in society, particularly for women, that are conditioning that result in situations often where the woman never would have wound up in the situation if she'd been willing to be impolite earlier on in the series of events. And that also was like really powerful to me, just that I started thinking about the ways that I will continue to experience my own discomfort instead of making someone else uncomfortable. And how often, and I mean, again, People in my real life and Jen and Sarah could say, I am a lot more direct than a lot of women. And still, I feel like I am constantly weighing what I say or don't say or do or don't do to protect someone else's comfort. And that can be at the expense of my own well being or the well being of other people in the situation. And so I just thought how that was really powerful. And they give some personal examples of that and situations where things got went way too far and could have been extremely perilous, all because as a young woman, you know, she didn't feel ready to make someone uncomfortable and to say no and make a scene and kind of get out of a bad situation. And I just thought that was another example that was just really, really powerful that showed something that I am aware of, but made me think of it in a new way. And so I feel like if you are a true crime fan, I absolutely think you would love this. But again, this one really worked for me as somebody who doesn't love the true crime stuff. It's still, I mean, I I loved it so much that I wanted to start listening to their podcast. I love what they had to say. I love the chemistry between the two of them. They just have a great rapport and you can see that in the book. And so all of that was awesome. So again, that is Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered. And it is by Georgia Hard Stark and Karen Kilgariff. And I loved it. I want to read that. That sounds good. It's really good. And the audio is so good. Yeah. They have like live events scattered through. And so you hear the audio from their live event. So I don't know. Yeah. How closely it hues to. It would be interesting to see what it's like on the page. Because you did only the audio. Right, Ashley? I did the audio. I got it from the library. And like Jen said, I mean, just a great audio Mm -hmm. experience. So yeah, I don't know. The print. It'd be interesting to know. But yeah, you'd love it, Sarah. It's going on my list. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Jen, what is your recommendation? So I feel like I'm recommending the book, but I'm going to talk about this whole universe. And I will just say, I do read a lot of murdery true crime also, but I know that that can be problematic. And like Ashley was talking about, it can, it can treat women in a way that is quite sensationalized. And so I wanted to recommend something that has transfixed me from the beginning, but also this is not... It's not murdery. So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, this one is safe. This is John Kerry Rue's Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. And I listened to this one on audio. And this was when I was still an ITRT and I was driving a lot for my job. And I would get to a school and just not want to go in for a minute because I had to find out what happened next. I, I just think this this book and this audio experience are excellent. And I feel like a lot of this may be on a lot of people's radar, but then maybe not. So this one is about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And the book was published in 2018. And so while the story had kind of wrapped up in large part because of Carrie Rue's reporting and this book, the trial hadn't happened. So I have been listening to his podcast, Bad Blood, the Final Chapter, which goes all the way through the trial, which at this point has ended. So we know that Elizabeth Holmes was found guilty on some charges, but not on others. But anyway, so if you're not familiar with this, Elizabeth Holmes is a young woman who began this absolutely phenomenal business that just took off and made tons and tons of money 
all on a series of promises for this technology that didn't actually exist. So she began with this idea that for people who are ill, who need to have a lot of blood testing done, it can be really difficult for people to take care of themselves and to make good decisions. And so she decided that she was going to bring on scientists and basically invent this system where you could do all of the medical testing you needed with a single drop of blood. So it's this very high minded initial idea And then what happens is, because that is not possible, she tricked a bunch of people into investing huge amounts of money. She perpetrated this series of cover-ups and created fake spaces in the lab so that they could give tours to people and show them what they were doing. And actually, they were using other companies' technology behind the scenes and running the blood tests on other people's technology. They were saying everything was going to be done on site and instead they were shipping it off. And the test results were so far off for some things that people got incorrect health information. So they were doing genetic testing on women who were pregnant and who are making decisions whether or not to continue pregnancies on the basis of genetic information that was not correct. They were telling people results for these diseases that they were testing for that were false and people were making decisions about their health on the basis of false information. I mean, it it just spirals. What is fascinating to me is twofold. So one, I think it's really fascinating the way Silicon Valley works and Carrie Rue does a really good job talking about the line behind or between selling yourself and selling your company and selling your vision When maybe everything's not quite in place, but you're confident that you're going to get there and the way to get people to invest is to get them to share your vision and out in that line. And at what point that that line is so shifting and Holmes herself, I think is very fascinating. So because I've listened to this podcast that has her voice in it and I've watched the documentary, The Inventor Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, you can see that she's this really charismatic person and the fact that she was a woman was part of the persona that she built, that she was this young woman who in Silicon Valley was doing all of this stuff. And she played on that in a big, big way. And you see how well she understands human nature and took advantage of people by selling this story that just was not true. One of the things that I found most interesting, both in the book and in the follow-up podcast is George Schultz was this very prominent person in the U.S. government. And he got his grandson to work for Theranos. And his grandson was part of bringing her down. But because of all of this, it absolutely ruined the relationship between George Schultz and his grandson. And so to just see the way she was able to manipulate this brilliant, a a bunch of brilliant men into believing her And that she actually ruined their relationships with family members. I mean, I just find it this really interesting dive into human nature and into the way industry works and the way startups work. It's all just, yeah, you can tell. (laughs) I'm just totally fascinated. I wanted to read and listen to and watch all the things because I think each new angle on it just shows some other interesting facet of where this all started. But the book is, I think, the best starting place. Carrie Rue's reporting is amazingly well-sourced and amazingly thorough. And watching the way he built his case and his investigation is also really interesting because he was so meticulous in building his whole case. So that is John Carrie Rue's Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup. And I will link all the rest of these things in the show notes too. So if you also become... (laughs) totally fascinated by (laughs) this universe of stories. You can check everything out. I think that that book is the one that kind of sparked my interest in this genre because Mm -hmm. I read that and I was like, I have to have more books like this because I was, I was just like, so enraptured with finding out what happened and how this could be. So I thought that was an excellent book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed that one as well. I Mm -hmm. was captivated. Yeah. All right, Sarah, what are you going to recommend? So I struggled with this because I, 
I like I said, I really like the genre and I had to, but I am going to go with the one I just read, which was fabulous in, in terms of reporting and sourcing. And this is Ronan Farrow's Catch and Kill, Lies, Spies, and a Conspiracy to Protect Predators. So this centers around the Harvey Weinstein story and his ultimate kind of bring down that happened over decades. So Ronan Farrow narrates this. I, I listened to the audiobook. It all starts with these rumors that had been like the Hollywood's kind of worst kept secret that Harvey Weinstein was a serial predator who lured young women and used his power and authority to coerce them or force himself on them for years. And I think what I, I would, when Ashley was talking about stay sexy and don't get murdered and talking about how, how the authors talked about what women do to, they cause themselves a lot of discomfort in order to not appear impolite or not to, and in this case, damage their career. And then it's because I think you could read this and some readers might say, why did you do, why did you take these steps and get to this point where this thing could happen to you. But I think like when you're talking about someone like Weinstein, who has all this power, and I mean, I I knew that he had a lot of power in Hollywood, but reading this book, you really realize just how far his power and because he had all this money, how he was able to be so well connected in government and politics. And, and I mean, have all these high powered lawyers and these international spies that were able to do all of this really horrific intimidation and harassment of these women. And so it's, so it's not just Hollywood. It's not just that area. He had, he had his hands in everything, politicians, police force, all this stuff. So the, these women, they, they just, I think that they just felt like they had no choice because there was no recourse and there was nobody willing to take the story and risk their own career crumbling. And so it was just this whole thing, like over decades that he was able to at best harass, at worst sexually assault these women. And it is horrifying. And what I loved is Ronan Farrow is so honest because he also has this really difficult story in his own life about his sister and his estranged father, Woody Allen, and the abuse that went on there. And so he is very forthcoming and and so honest in telling everything about that in terms of his role in that, and then also making sure that these women's voices are heard, heard at the expense of his own safety and his own career. And so that I felt like he was just so diligent and because there were a lot of barriers put up for him in order to report this story. There is also beyond Harvey Weinstein, there's also a story about just the systemic patriarchal society in which they like the news outlets have run over years and also the continual abuse of women in those those areas and the way that they are silenced. And it is, it was horrifying. I, one day I went into work and I was listening to it on the way to work and I just had to spout it all off. I just had to get off my chest. And I mean, I was like sweating and my, <laughs> they were like, you're getting red. But I just, I was so horrified that I live in a society in 2022 that this is still happening. And like the men who were in power when this was written, they are still in power now. And even though it is documented that they covered up these stories, they killed the story so that because of their dedication to Weinstein and it talks to stuff about Matt Lauer and some of that, it is all horrific, but it is well-researched. It is well-sourced. It is a fascinating story of power, greed, and how m- when you have the money, you have the power. And I highly recommend it. I think it was fabulous. And I think I think as women, we need to read these types of stories so that we know what is happening and how your voices can be silenced. And I mm-hmm. thought it was fabulous. Oh, that sounds so good. That is definitely <laughs> on my list. Yeah, me too. But I mean, it is infuriating, especially as, you know, as a woman, when you listen to this and you 
realize, I guess I feel kind of sheltered where I am and like being in a profession that is really widely female, like you, I don't feel as vulnerable to things like that. But then when you are listening to these stories of these women who are in a predominantly male dominated high stakes type of situations, it is really, really hard to listen to, but I think important to hear. (sighs) It feels like a journey, women. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) I always feel like when we talk about these things, it is very hard to transition to the next segment. I'm also sweating again, just so you know, (laughs) because I just get so wound up with this and I just get really upset about these Mm -hmm. things. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So uh, we hope that you will give us some of your recommendations for this genre, because I guarantee you they will go on my list because I just really, I think it's important to listen to and read well-researched, well-sourced books like these ones that we've mentioned, because it's important to know these stories, but without the sensationalism that -hmm. can sometimes come with them. So I think reading books by trusted investigative reporters like Pharaoh and Kiryu. And Pharaoh, just so you know, he won a Pulitzer for his work on this story. So I think reading those books by these types of people, you're able to get the information without the sensationalism. So, And I will say that even though it's absolutely infuriating, I do think it's also empowering to see the ways that these can bring about change. So while we have to confront how broken some of these systems are and how far reaching that brokenness is. And not, I mean, I'd say broken, but actually it's that purposefully there are mm-hmm. continual efforts being made to uphold right. these systems. So broken suggests it's again, like we were talking about with the terminology suggests it's like not their fault. There right. are people that are purposefully and actively doing things exactly like you said with Weinstein to uphold and let this continue to happen with impunity. Mm -hmm. But I do think the other thing is it is so powerful to see that with that deep dive, with drawing attention, with researching and proving and risking sometimes positive change does come. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a really hopeful part of this genre. Well, and I think so often we bemoan media as this single entity that does not always emphasize the right things, but then you see the role that journalism can take in bringing about change. And I mean, that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to confront power and tell stories that speak for the victims. And yeah, yeah, so I think these are great examples of that. All right. So we will be transitioning to our last topic, our Give Me One. And we are going to tell you today the person that you would choose to narrate your favorite book. And this we wanted just to to credit. This is from the Lit Chat game that Book Riot produced. And if you are a longtime listener, you know, in the past we have done whole episodes based on this game. But I think they're probably in the archives now. But if you have listened since we began, you know that that you might recognize this Lit Chat reference. So, Jen, what is your choice? So... I wanted to shout out Bonnie Turpin. We've talked about her on the podcast before, but I feel like I listen to books just because she reads them. So she is absolutely amazing. That's a great choice. Ashley, how about you? So I do also love Bonnie Turpin, but I wanted to share Natalie Nottis. I have listened to several of hers recently. A couple of them are The Heart Principle that we talked about for our book club. And she did The Donut Trap that I also loved. And she did One Last Stop. So I have listened to several of hers recently. She does some of Marie Lou's work, which I absolutely love. So yeah, she's one that I, she wasn't on my radar so much. And then I started to recognize her voice and realize there was a slew of ones I had listened to and loved that she did. So Natalie Nottis is my choice. That's a great choice. What about you, Sarah? I'm going with Jim Dale. I feel like for him, he's the OG audiobook guy that I read first. He's the first uh, the first audiobook I ever really read was one narrated by him, and he is absolutely fantastic. I think that was true for me too, Sarah. You know, <laughs> back in the day before I really listened to any audiobooks, I heard one of his and did it in a car ride with CDs, and I was like, oh, this is <laughs> <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> 
All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening today. We hope that you will share your favorite true crime recommendations with us over at Unabridged Pod. And we thank you for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.